Hello to all physics enthusiasts and fans of physical experiments. I'm Andrei Shchetnikov. I congratulate you on the new year, and here we continue our high intellectual activities. Last year, we spent a substantial amount of time on various paradoxes of hydrodynamics and intricacies. We talked a lot about the curved pipe paradox and the question of how Feynman's rotor works, as well as where the thrust is applied in a jet engine, and nuances in much greater detail. And I think our exploration of the paradoxes of hydrodynamics will continue this year. Well, we need to say, what is a paradox? It's something we shouldn't forget about. A paradox is a situation where we get caught in a trap in our reasoning, one that we set for ourselves without even realizing it or planning for it. And dealing with paradoxes is definitely very useful because it allows us to learn a lot about the nature of things as well as about our own thinking, where our mistakes come from, and how all of this happens. And dealing with paradoxes is definitely very useful because it allows us to learn a lot about the nature of things and about our thinking, about where our mistakes come from, how it all happens. And so, I want to present this paradox for your consideration now. And the paradox that we're going to discuss now came to me while I was preparing a video about the air-breathing jet engine. But there are so many of its own problems. So, it's not easy to understand where the reaction force is applied in this engine. I thought that some of the questions make sense to address in a separate preparatory video. So I've prepared a kind of model for this, connecting two tubes, a wide one and a narrow one. And imagine that we are sitting in a large wind tunnel right now, and air is flowing towards us from there. Can you imagine that we're sitting on a plane up top, holding this tube, and there's airflow coming towards us? It's tempting to think that air flows into the wide part, then it narrows down and exits through the narrow part. So, the flow should probably exit from here at a higher speed than the speed at which it enters the wide throat. If so, in fact, it actually turns out that this thing essentially accelerates the air and serves as a kind of engine, although we didn't burn any fuel in it, right? And it seems like there's a mistake lurking somewhere in our reasoning. It can't be that such a device, without any energy input, just sitting on top of a plane, works like a jet engine. And that's the mistake we need to find in this video. It can't be that such a device, without any energy input, just sitting on the roof of a plane, works like a jet engine. And it's this mistake that we need to find in this video. So here I start to think and say, well, okay, Let's assume it's true that there's an accelerated jet coming out of the back nozzle. Let me draw the pressure then. Here it is, flowing out into the atmosphere. This means that the pressure in the jet here is atmospheric. So I've drawn the line for atmospheric pressure, and I'll be drawing everything relative to it. So, I have atmospheric pressure here. The jet isn't accelerating here. It's atmospheric pressure everywhere. And here my jet is narrowing. So it's accelerating in this spot. This means that right here, in the conical section, the pressure is higher than in the cylindrical back part. And overall, it keeps increasing here to push the air into the narrow tube. Well, here the pressure has leveled out again. And overall, it keeps increasing here to push the air into the narrow tube. Well, here the pressure has leveled out again. And now I come from this side and say, well, gosh, if I come from here, then the pressure was atmospheric. And here I have a break happening. This line here doesn't match up with that line. And I say it's clear what's going on. This means that right here at the entrance, I have an area of increased pressure. In this illustration, you can see how it is drawn. Now let's explore what implications this has for the air that is flowing into this area. How does it affect the movement and behavior of the air as it enters? And this means that as it approaches this area, it slows down, just like it speeds up when it comes out of this area. And since it's actually slowing down, that indeed means the central flow line is like this. And here I have this expanding funnel shape. 
As the air flows into this area, it slows down and the jet expands. And we need to look at how this section corresponds, not to the inlet section, but to the section somewhere here in the funnel. And here, the speed I have is the same as it will be back there at the exit. Well, the pressure lines are here accordingly. It needs to be drawn like this, meaning everything happens as if there's a narrowing part of the funnel right here. It's definitely purely imaginary. The funnel was only at the back, but here I kind of mentally complete this part. And then there's no contradiction about the speed at which the air was flowing in here. It flows out like that, slowing down at the entrance of this expanding funnel and speeding up at the exit of this narrowing funnel. So now I want to take and draw this picture. Not in reasoning anymore, but in some program. But I usually use, as you know, the Visimac program for modeling magnetic field lines, since the equations that describe the flow lines of an ideal fluid and magnetic field lines are the same. And we can take a look at this picture. Let's take a look at it. So here we see the atmospheric pressure is shown in green. And in the inlet area, the pressure is indeed higher than atmospheric. It's shown here in blue. But in the outlet tube, the pressure is definitely not atmospheric, as I reasoned. It's below atmospheric. It's shown in red. And then at the exit of this nozzle, the pressure becomes atmospheric again. So, not everything was taken into account in my previous reasoning. And this advanced computer simulation allows us to refine our reasoning in a more precise and detailed manner. So, I changed my picture and showed that here the pressure increases before entering the pipe. And here in the wide part, it's above atmospheric pressure, while in the narrow part, it turns out to be below atmospheric pressure. Then, after the exit, the pressure quickly drops. No, it rises to atmospheric pressure, but that means there's a slight expansion of the flow in this part. Well, now, of course, I want to see all of this in the experiment. Well, in any case, we can try to measure the pressure in some kind of narrowing tube, which is what we're going to do now. And for this purpose, I put together this rather primitive setup. This is definitely not an aerodynamic tube just a vacuum cleaner hose. Here, on the contrary, there's a narrowing cup with a cut-off bottom. And I also have a relative pressure sensor, which is a device that measures pressure relative to atmospheric pressure. Starting it up, we see that the pressure relative to atmospheric pressure is zero. And now I'm turning on the vacuum cleaner and the And as I observe, I see that the pressure in this area is significantly elevated. It increases further, noticeably, and only towards the end of the pipe does the pressure drop and even become slightly negative of the system, where it drops to zero to atmospheric pressure. And in general, I would say that it turned out that what we saw was closer to my original diagram than to the refined one we saw practically no negative pressure on the constriction. We can't ignore viscous friction in this system. We saw 150 pascals over pressure. This will help in our jet engine video. And yet, we saw significant boost, 150 pascals in the main part of the pipe. And these thoughts about supercharging will indeed, of course, be very beneficial to us in the video about the ramjet engine, which we are going to film Well, now our conclusion, which is indeed worth repeating again. If you have an airflow approaching a narrowing pipe, not all of that entire cylinder flows into the pipe, but only a much narrower stream that expands as it approaches, like a funnel. And here, the pressure in the pipe is elevated compared to the external atmospheric pressure. Well, by the way, now it's probably time to ask our final question. What will happen if I position the pipe the other way around with the tapering part in relation to the airflow? How will the pressure distribute now? Share your thoughts on this in the comments for this video on YouTube.